In this unit, what we're going to talk about are real valued functions. So these are functions, say of the form f is a map from r2 to r, or f is a map from r3 to r, or perhaps f is a map from a subset a of, I will write rn here to mean r2, r3, or whatever space you'd like, to r. The key distinction here being that the function is going to take in vectors and return scalars. This is the opposite of the type of functions that we were just looking at when we had curves. So for parametric curves, we plugged in a scalar t, typically, and the output was a vector. Here we're going to be plugging in multiple variables, and then the types of values we get out of the function are scalars. Let me write down the typical notation that we would see for the first two cases. So when we have a scalar valued function of two variables, most often that's going to look like z is a function of x and y. If our function is a map from r3 to r, we might think of that as w is a function of x, y, and z. A function from r to r, like you would have studied in single variable calculus, is a function of the form y equals f of x. So this is just generalizing that notion. We're going to focus a lot on visualizing these functions. So what does it mean to graph a function? Let me start with a context that you've done a lot, which is functions from r to r. We can say that graphing the equation y equals f of x means creating a plot of all of the points of the form x comma f of x, where of course x has to come from the domain of f. This is a function of one variable, and the graph is a pair of coordinates, x and f of x, so the graph is pictured in R2. So the graph of a function of the form z equals f of x and y is a picture of the points of the form x comma y comma f of x and y, and that would be a picture that would live in R3. So here the set description is saying it's the set of points of the form x, y, f of x and y, where the first two coordinates, x and y, belong to the domain of f, because otherwise you couldn't plug them in and get that third coordinate. If f is continuous, the graph of this type of function is one example of what we will call a surface. So I haven't said what continuous means, but you have a good feeling for what a continuous function ought to be, nor have I defined what a surface is, but we're going to build up our understanding of surfaces throughout this unit. So basically, when we graph a function of the form y equals f of x, we expect it to trace out a curve in R2, assuming that our function is nice and continuous, so something like y equals x squared gives us a parabola. A scalar value function of two variables, z equals f of x and y, if, if this is a nice continuous function, then what we're going to see emerge from the graph of this is the shape of a surface. We'll see a lot of examples going forwards. Then I'm not going to write on here what it would mean to graph a function from r3 to r, say a function of the form w equals f of x, y, and z, in part because I'm out of room on the slide, but also because we can't actually graph this function it would be the set of points of the form x, y, z, w, or x, y, z, f of x, y, and z, which would be a subset of four-dimensional space. So keep in mind here, when we're working with functions of multiple variables, which are scalar-valued, always make sure that you're treating the dimensions correctly. So if you're graphing a function of two variables, it should be a picture in R3. If you feel like you're supposed to graph a function of three variables, you really need to question that because that would be a picture in four-dimensional space. Okay, we're going to look at three examples. So here's a function, f of x and y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. We want to work out what the domain is, what the range is, and then we're going to draw a picture of the domain and of the graph of the function. So I've written here f is a function of x and y, but you could think of this as z equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And 
then how I would prefer to think of that is actually z equals the square root of 4 minus the quantity x squared plus y squared. With that rearrangement, it's easier to see what the domain has to be. So what are the types of x and y values that we can legally plug into this function and get a real valued answer? So we don't want anything that's imaginary. We only want to work with real valued outputs. And the answer is that we need x squared plus y squared to be less than or equal to 4, so that we're taking the square root of a non-negative quantity. Written with set notation, I'm going to say that the domain of f is the set of all x, y coordinates from R2 such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. I may have used this symbol already. This kind of funny e looking shape here means is an element of. So these are all the x, y pairings, which are elements of R2. In other words, they're just x, y coordinates from R2, so that the sum of their squares is less than or equal to 4. Let me sketch a picture of this domain. The domain is a subset of R2, so we're working in the x, y plane. What would be the set of points in the x, y plane satisfying that x squared plus y squared equals 4? Well, that'd be a circle of radius 2. We're looking for points x, y so that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. It's either inside the circle or outside the circle. You can just check that the origin makes that statement true. So our domain is the inside of this circle. This is a solid disk of radius 2. So that's the domain of the function. What about the range? The range is going to be a subset of r. This is a scalar valued function. So this is the set of possible z values. As you work more and more with these functions, it'll become a faster process. But what I would do is start at the origin. If x and y are both 0, what would happen? z would be the square root of 4. That's 2. So I travel outward. Say I'm on the unit circle. If x squared plus y squared is 1, then z would be the square root of 3. I go all the way out to the edge of the domain, where x squared plus y squared equals 4. z would be 0. So it seems like we're going to get values of z between 0 on the edge and 2 at the center. And that is, in fact, the range. So it's the closed bounded interval from 0 to 2. Now let's sketch the graph of this function. So this is the set of points of the form x, y, f of x, and y. You could just start plotting points. But actually, there's one large behavior here that we can identify if we take the original equation, or say we take the equation z equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and we square both sides. So if z satisfies that equation, then z squared equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. The reverse is not necessarily true, because z could be negative and satisfy the equation on the right, but not the equation on the left. Now let me put all the squared terms on the same side of the equation, and we can write x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. So the graph of this equation is a subset of the sphere of radius 2. Just a reminder that for a sphere, we often denote the radius by rho. OK, it's not going to be the entire sphere, because z is non-negative. So it's only the part of the sphere for which the z values range from 0 to 2. In other words, it's the upper hemisphere. So if I take my sphere, let's say that's the entire sphere. I'm going to cheat by drawing the sphere first, and then I'm going to erase the lower hemisphere. OK, that's now the upper hemisphere. And now that I have my upper hemisphere, I'm going to draw my axes. Eh, it's not my favorite, but it's OK. It's kind of like if you have a big barn wall in your backyard and you want to impress people by your amazing dart throwing ability, first throw the darts and then draw the bullseye. OK, so that's what I did here is I first drew the graph of the function and then I put in the axes. Even so, it's not that great of a picture, but this would be the graph of z equals f of x and y. Keep in mind, when we say hemisphere, we are only talking about the edge. So it's only the points 
with non-negative z-coordinates, which are exactly distanced to you from the origin. It's not the interior. So it's just this shell on the outside. Okay, now let's look at this function of three variables. f of x, y, and z is the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. We wanna find the domain and range, and then we wanna discuss the pictures that we could draw for this function. So we'll sketch a picture of the domain, and then we'll talk about why it doesn't make sense to sketch the graph of this function. My first few steps are gonna be similar to before. What I'm going to do is take f of x, y, and z and think of this as a fourth coordinate w. Then inside my radicand, I'm gonna factor out a negative one so that I can write this as four minus the sum x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that means that my domain is the subset of R3 so that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to four. In other words, the domain is the solid sphere of radius two in R3. To make the vocabulary here precise, if we say sphere of radius two, we're just talking about the edge. If we say solid sphere, we're talking about the edge plus the interior. Okay, let's determine the range for this function. So what are the possible W values that we could get if we chose points from this domain and plugged them into the function? Well, it's analogous to the previous example. At the origin, we would have a W value of square root of four, that's two. And as we work our way outside to having a radius of two, we would get a W value of zero. So it's everything in between. Once again, the range is the closed bounded interval from zero to two, which you could also think of as zero less than or equal to W less than or equal to two. Can we graph this function? And the answer is no, because the domain is in R3. So if we could graph this function, we would be graphing points of the form x, y, z, f of x, y, and z in R4. So the answer is no, we are not going to sketch a graph of this function. Let's finish this lecture with this example. Here, f is a map on x, y, and z, and the outputs look like the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared. So I would first call the output w and say that w is the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared. Or alternatively, I can pull that negative out and write four minus the quantity x squared plus y squared. So notice our domain is a subset of R3, even though I only see x and y here, and that's okay. So our domain is the set of points x, y, z, so that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four. x squared plus y squared equals four defines a circular cylinder in R3 whose central axis is the z-axis. Okay, so that's a part of the cylinder. Of course, it goes up forever and down forever. And it's the solid cylinder because we need x squared plus y squared less than or equal to four. So it's the cylinder, which is like the edge, plus the interior. What is the range of this function? Well, once again, if you kind of work from the central z-axis outwards, you're gonna go from values of two down to zero. So the range is the closed bounded interval from zero to two, or zero is less than or equal to w is less than or equal to two. Can we sketch the graph of this function? And the answer is no, because once again, it would be a subset of four-dimensional space. That's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to graph more equations and ultimately look at what we call quadric surfaces. Before watching that lecture, what you might want to do is review conic sections because it's going to be sort of similar to conic sections. Thank you for your attention.